Brothers and sisters and friends, it's nice to be with you. I've chosen to uh, address a topic that's one that uh, I suppose we would rather not talk about, but it's one that you, each of you will face, whether you serve a full-time mission or, or not. It's the matter of opposition, opposition to the faith. And for want of a better phrase, I'm just going to use the phrase wisdom in response. And today deal with the question of how is it that we ought to, or that we could, deal with opposition that we're going to face. I don't just mean slamming a door in the face. I'm talking a little more specifically about um, the kind of opposition that will come in, in the form anti-Mormonism, questions that will be asked of, uh, by persons who might be sincere or by persons who really intend to attack the faith that you have. To begin, just as, just as some introductory thoughts, let me suggest some ideas that I hope you'll consider. The first idea, every one of us can have sufficient knowledge and testimony to defend the faith. It doesn't require university training, it doesn't require advanced degrees. Um, what we're talking about is having a witness of the spirit that empowers us. Now that spiritual witness can always be reinforced by how much you know and so the more we know about the gospel the more we're able to give a knowledgeable witness. Secondly, we really aren't obligated to answer everyone's questions. I've not had all of my questions answered. The Lord hasn't chosen to do that. He probably hasn't answered all of yours. And nor are we obligated to answer everyone else's questions. Let me give you an example. If, if any of you brought, any, brought your scriptures with you, I want to go to the 11th chapter of Alma, where Zeezrom, the lawyer is questioning Amulek. Alma chapter 11, verse 21. And notice what's said here. A, que que a series of questions are being asked. Verse 21. And this Zeezrom began to question Amulek, saying, Will you answer me a few questions which I shall ask you? Now, Zeezrom was a man who was expert in the devices of the devil, that he might destroy that which was good. Wherefore, he said unto Amulek, Will you answer the questions which I shall put unto you? Notice Amulek's answer. Amulek said unto him, Yea, if it be according to the Spirit of the Lord, which is in me, for I shall say nothing which is contrary to the Spirit of the Lord. And so even though we have the fullness of the gospel, and even though we have many, many questions to some of life's most challenging, uh, answers to some of life's most challenging questions, it isn't necessarily the case that we always answer every question. The third introductory point I would make is this. As Latter-day Saints, you already know more about God and Christ and the plan of salvation than anyone who will attack you. I'll take my word for that. You already know more than your attackers will ever know. And so you and I should take some degree of confidence in that. It shouldn't be a shock to us that people oppose us. For some reason or other, because of my work with the church educational system through the years, I've been involved directly with a lot of opposition to the church. I spend a good deal of my time today addressing issues that people raise, either people within the church or people outside the church, hard questions that they want to raise. It shouldn't be a shock to us that this is the case. In 1845, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles issued a proclamation to all the world. 
sort of like our family proclamation. Well, this was the first one, first major one. I want to read just a sentence or two from that proclamation and see what this has to do with you who will be serving missions in a very short time. As this work progresses in its onward course and becomes more and more an object of political and religious interest and excitement, no king, ruler, or subject, no community or individual will stand neutral. All will at length be influenced by one spirit or the other and will take sides either for or against the kingdom of God. Now I've seen to some extent that come to pass in my lifetime. What I'm saying that I think this is saying is as time passes there will be fewer and fewer people who will say about the Latter-day Saints, oh, well, they're okay. You know. You'll have more people saying, they're great, marvelous folks, or they're a blight on humanity that needs to be removed. Okay? And so this, this prophecy from 1845 indicates that we need not be shocked or surprised if we are opposed in this work. Another introductory thought. Consider this. The things of God can only be known in a real way by the power of the Spirit of God. Or to say that another way, the truthfulness of a matter, especially of a religious matter, is really only to be known by the quiet whisperings of the Holy Spirit. But, but how significant that thing is may often be known by the loud opposition that comes in response to it. So the truthfulness of the matter can only be known by the Spirit of God, the quiet whisperings of the Spirit of God. But but just how significant it is might be known by the kind of opposition it engenders. Let me give you an example. What do the following locations have in common? Denver, Nashville, Portland, Atlanta, White Plains, um, any ideas so far? Temples. We announced that we wanted to build a temple in those areas, and what happened? Critics of the church came out of the woodwork. In areas where we thought we were appreciated and loved and respected, we, we found enemies we didn't know we had. Now, here's the point. If I didn't already know by the quiet whisperings of the Holy Spirit to my heart that what goes on in temples is deeply significant, eternally significant. I might guess that something's up by the kind of opposition that people have to temples. And so, quiet whisperings, the way the truth is known, loud janglings, the significance. President Brigham Young is reported to have said that every time we announce the building of a temple, all the bells of hell begin to ring. And Brother Brigham said, and oh, how I love to hear those bells. Okay. Temples is one example. Let me ask you about another one. Why would it be that the Book of Mormon would receive such opposition from people? Why would it be that a book that is just white pages with black ink whose teachings are very Christ-centered and encourage people to come unto Christ and point their lives to Him, whose teachings are uplifting and edifying, why would it be that the Book of Mormon would be so opposed? And it's terrifically opposed, you need to know that. Well, if I didn't already know by the quiet whisperings of the Holy Spirit to my soul that the Book of Mormon is indeed another testament of Jesus Christ, 
I might suspect that that's the case by the kind of loud opposition that we receive in regard to the Book of Mormon. The same is true with the concept of only true church. You will find that that will not be a popular concept. Um, that's not one that people will say, oh, well, thank you so much for, for saying that. If I didn't already know by the whisperings of the Spirit to my soul that the, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is in fact the Kingdom of God on earth, that we hold the fullness of the Gospel, that we hold the priesthood of Almighty God, if I didn't already know that in a quiet way, I might suspect that's the case by the kind of loud opposition that that very concept elicits from people. You may recall that in the history of our church, when our missionaries went to Great Britain, that uh, Heber C. Kimball and some of his colleagues, Orson Hyde and some others, began to make some real progress in Preston, England. They scheduled a baptism, and the night before the baptism, they were attacked by evil spirits. For a period of over an hour, evil spirits, they were given, the, our, our, our brethren were given the, the vision of the fact that evil spirits were coming upon them, were gnashing their teeth against them, and were cursing them. Brother Heber C. Kimball said that after that hour I was so weakened that I could hardly stand up. He said, my clothes were so drenched with perspiration, it, it was as if someone had thrown me in the river. It worried Brother Kimball that such a thing should happen. When he later spoke to the Prophet Joseph Smith, he asked if perhaps they had done something wrong. And the Prophet Joseph answered, oh no, he said. He said, uh, when I heard your report, I knew that you were, that, that night you were nigh unto God. He said, when I heard it, I rejoiced because I knew that the work of the Lord had taken root in that land. And then the prophet Joseph uttered this great principle. He said, the nearer a man approaches the Lord, the greater the power of the adversary will be manifest to thwart the accomplishment of God's purposes. And so opposition will come with the turf. If you remember, if you've had occasion, perhaps in your missionary preparation class, or on your own, if you remember this wonderful article by Elder Jeffrey Holland of the Twelve about missionary work in the atonement, he asked a very significant question. Why should missionary work be so hard? I mean, we have the truth. We have something that will bless lives. We have something that will make people better and happier and more, more joyous. Why should it be so hard to bring people into the faith? And then Elder Holland's marvelous, insightful comment was this. Well, what did it cost Jesus to save souls? What he experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane and what he experienced on the cross was not exactly easy. The salvation of souls doesn't come cheaply. It comes through a heavy price. And so why should missionary work, which is involved with the salvation of souls, why should we suppose that it would come cheaply? It's hard work, but terribly rewarding. Now, let's suggest some principles that ought to guide our response to questions, to issues that are raised. Principle number one. To the extent that we can, and we have control over this, we ought to avoid the spirit of contention. Avoid the spirit of contention. You will recall that the Savior 
taught that in 3 Nephi chapter 11, that he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil. There's, there's another way of putting this. Even though you're right in the message you have to deliver, if you contend or argue or debate about spiritual things, you're wrong. Your message may be right, but your approach is wrong, and you will not enjoy the Spirit of the Lord in the process. We do not argue, we do not debate. We teach and we testify. And so we avoid the spirit of contention. Um, let me show you an example in, in Scripture that's a bit sobering. I just stumbled across this a few years ago. In the Book of Mormon again, in Alma chapter 1, Beginning in verse 19, notice what happens. Alma 1, 19, and we're going to read through verse 24. It came to pass that whosoever did not belong to the church of God began to persecute those that did belong to the church of God and had taken upon them the name of Christ. That is to say, those outside the faith began to persecute the members of the church. Yea, they did persecute them and afflict them with all manner of words. And this because of their humility, because they were not proud in their own eyes, and because they did impart the word of God one with another without money and without price. Now note this. Now there was a strict law among the people of the church, so there's a church regulation, that there should not any man belonging to the church arise and persecute those that did not belong to the church, and that there should be no persecution among themselves. Now here's a key verse. Nevertheless, there were many among them, meaning many among the members of the church, who began to be proud and began to contend warmly, that means in a hot way, with their adversaries, even unto blows, yea, they would smite one another with their fists. Now, I've had some pretty hefty scriptural discussions, but I've, I've never hit, about, hit anybody in the face with my fist over it. So this, this is the members of the church who have the truth, and they're contending warmly, as it were. They're in a fist fight over the faith. That's real contention. Now this was in the second year of the reign of Alma, and it was a cause of much affliction to the church. It was the cause of much trial with the church. Now notice this verse, which I think is haunting. For the hearts of many, meaning those in the church, were hardened, and their names were blotted out, that they were remembered no more among the people of God. Now what does it mean to have your name blotted out? What happens if you're blotted out? If your name is blotted out? You're excommunicated. Here's an example then of a people, members of the church, who were so intent on teaching the truth and cramming it down the throats of those they were teaching that they lost the spirit of the Lord and they became anti-antis, okay? Now again, the Savior taught us he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil. So we do not argue, we do not fight, we do not debate, we teach and we testify. Point number two, second suggestion. The principle I'd like to get across to you is this. We learn to answer the right question. Answer the right question. Let me tell you of a personal experience. I had been on a mission a grand total of two days, two or three days, a short time anyway, when my companion said, come on, we're going to a street meeting today. I said, what's a street meeting? He said, you'll see. I was in the Eastern States mission, then the headquarters were then in New York City. We lived in New York City, in Manhattan. 
We went down to a place where every Tuesday at noon, I discovered, a little soapbox was set up and the missionaries, one of the missionaries, would stand on the soapbox and preach. Now, this was located, to give you a feeling of where this is, every, we had our spot, it was right, it was, it was on the corner of Wall Street and Nassau. That's right across the street from the stock exchange. So we get to the street meeting, and I, I was excited to see this. I mean, this sounded Parley P. Pratt and Wilford Woodruff style, you know. And, and so I was all psyched to watch someone do this when suddenly the zone leader turns to me and said, Okay, Elder Millen, go preach to us. I said, What? He said, Go stand up there and preach the gospel. I said, w w What do you want me to say? He said, Well, tell us about the apostasy and the restoration. I said, but there's no one here. He said, well, teach us for now. He said, in a few minutes, someone will come. So I, to be obedient, I went and stood on the box, and I began to speak, and missionaries began to say, a little louder, a little louder. So I got into this and really got to going. Then I heard a bell ring across the street, and within moments, the doors opened, and hundreds of people came out. It was lunchtime. And I'll bet we had a hundred or two hundred people standing around listening to me preach. Well, I really felt like Parley P. Pratt and Wilfred Woodruff now. I mean, this is something. I mean. And so I was very eloquent, and I, I mean, uh, it was impressive. Um, and I finally finished and stepped down, and then the missionary spread out among the people and began to ask questions of the people and offer pamphlets and answer their questions. At that point, as I stepped down, a very large African-American man came up to me and said, do you have a minute I could ask you a question? I said, certainly. Now keep in mind, this is 1967. He pulls me over into a corner, and, he, and he's very large. He's, he must have been about 6'5", and I would guess maybe about 260. He takes his hand, and he puts it right here. And he sort of pushes up on my throat and squeezes a little bit, and he says, I want the priesthood. I said, excuse me? He said, I want you to give me the priesthood. I remember thinking, I just want to go home. You know, it was a very uncomfortable moment. And he applied it a little tighter, lifted a little more. And he said, no, I he said, you know, my mom always wanted me to be a priest. Uh, I want the priesthood. Can you give me the priesthood? And I said, I, I'm sorry, I can't. Why can't you? He said, as he tightened and as he lifted. At this point, I'm on my tiptoes, okay? And, and, and the, the ability to speak or to breathe is being restricted. And, I, and I, I'd like to think it was a, a spirit of, in, a flash of inspiration that came. But this came into my mind. I said, may I ask you a question or two? He said, sure. I said, do you believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's Church? He said, no. He said, I don't believe the Lord has a church. I said, do you believe that God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ appeared to the boy Joseph Smith in a grove of trees in the spring of 1820? He said, uh, no, I do not. I said, do you believe that heavenly messengers came down, laid their hands upon the head of Joseph Smith, and conferred upon him divine authority? Angels came, and he laughed. He said, angels? I don't believe in angels. Then I turned to him and I said, well, sir, I suppose we're not really refusing you anything after all, are we? There was this long pause. He let go of my throat, and I came back down to earth. And he looked at me, he stepped back, and he smiled. And he, and he took his huge hand, and he sort of patted me a couple of times on the cheek, and he said, that was good. And he walked away, okay? Now clearly he'd done this many times, okay? Uh, and tied missionaries in knots. It was a long time, really, almost a decade, before I realized what I had done right. Because I had done something right, okay? At least I, I'm still alive, all right? 
It was years later that I was reading Elder Packer's book, Teach Ye Diligently, where Elder Packer tells of an experience of traveling with President Henry D. Moyle of the First Presidency and how repeatedly President Moyle was given these antagonistic and baiting difficult questions by news reporters and interviewers and how that in every case President Moyle just, and the church just came out smelling like a rose. Well, the Packer was fascinated with this and as they drove away once Elder Packer said President that was that was amazing. What? What, what you just did? He said how do you how do you do that? They ask you these hard, hard questions. How do you do that? You, we look, you know, you came out looking great. President Moyle said, Boyd, whenever a person asks me an antagonistic question, I never answer that question, but rather I answer the question they should have asked. That's why I, I group this under answer the right question. For example, and this will lead into the next principle in just a second. For example, if a person out of the blue that I don't know from Adam walks up to me and says, so you're a Latter-day Saint. Uh -huh. Tell me, uh, you folks believe that man can become like God, huh? See, how do I respond? I mean, this is a total stranger. I don't know what he knows about the church. It may not be the smartest thing in the world to say, yeah, yeah, let me, let me quote the Lorenzo Snow couplet for you, and then I'm going to get the teachings of the prophet, and I'm going to read to you the King Follett Discourse. That may not be our best approach. It might be a much wiser approach to say, well, that's an interesting question. It is asked frequently. But, you know, let me, let me begin this way. In the spring of 1820, there was a young man named Joseph Smith, Jr., who was concerned about the subject of religion and, and wanted to know which church to join. Dot, 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 dot. What did I just do? I just answered the question he should have asked. Now what's the question he should have asked? How do I know that what you have to say is true? Or what should I know to investigate your message properly? How shall we begin our study of Mormonism? That would have been the right question, you see. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer the question they should have asked. Now let me say it another way. The, the world may not know this, but the issue isn't Adam God. The issue isn't Mountain Meadows Massacre. The issue isn't plural marriage. The issue facing the religious world today is, was Joseph Smith called of God? And that's the single most important issue to determine. And they're going to find that out in only one way, by learning a little bit and praying a lot. Point number three. And it relates to what we were just talking about. The principle, let's state the principle. We never provide meat when milk will do. We never provide meat when milk will do. Illustration. I had been on my mission, oh, I suppose 18 months. My companion and I were in a lovely community in Upper Connecticut. We were tracting one afternoon, a beautiful, beautiful spring day in this area we lived. My companion was an interesting sort of fellow. He was a good guy, very bright. There, there was one thing he, he did, though, that sort of affected the work adversely, and that is that his mind never seemed to be with us. Okay, His mind was always somewhere else. We're, we're moving down the street, and we come to this next door, and it's his door. It's his, his turn to speak out for us. So he knocks on the door. Oh, uh, a lovely young woman, I would just say her middle days, uh, opens the door, unlatches the screen door she had, and opens and she says, yes. And he says, hi, we're, we're ministers from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have a message 
of great importance to share with you. She responds, uh, no, I don't think so because um, I already have my faith. At that point, my companion sort of drifted off into Nowheresville and didn't say anything. And so I'm sitting there, standing there waiting with this long pause. And finally, I just sort of stepped in and said, uh, well, tell us, where, where do you go to church? And she came back quickly. She said, I didn't say I had a church. I said I had a faith. Oh, I said, well, well tell us about your faith. She said, no, nah, I think you'd make fun of me. I said, I promise we won't make fun of you. Tell, tell us about your faith. We're interested. She said, well, I believe strongly in what the scriptures teach. I said, well, good. What is that? She said, well, I believe that the, that the human body is the temple of God, that we ought to take care of our bodies. I said, well, that's, that's beautiful. What else do you believe? She said, well, it goes further than that. She said, for example, I don't think people ought to smoke or drink. I said, really? I said, that's a, that's a beautiful concept. Uh, anything else? She said, well, this is where you're going to laugh at me. I said, what do you mean? She said, I don't even drink coffee or tea. <laughs> and then she said, what do the Latter-day Saints believe? And I thought, well, this is a golden opportunity. I stepped back. It was his door. And I looked over at him. And I could see the mental machinery starting to work. And out of the blue, he looks at her and he says, Well, we believe in baptism for the dead. She gets this really funny look on her face. She pulls the screen door shut, latches it. And as she's closing her door, her main door, she says, That sounds really sick. And she slams the door. So here we are standing on the doorstep. I am absolutely bowled over, okay? I turned to him and I said, Elder, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? I said, why would you say that? He said, well, we do believe in baptism for the dead, don't we? I said, yeah, yeah, we do. Why didn't you start with polygamy or something? <laughs> he said, I thought about that doing next, doing that next, but she closed the door. I said, Elder, this lady lives the word of wisdom. He said, I thought that was odd. <laughs> so here we have a woman who essentially comes to the door with her tin cup and says, I thirst. And so what do we say? Hey, can we fix that? Whoa, we can fix that. And we grab the fire hose, okay? Whoa. And we, and we drown them in the living water, okay? Now, it isn't that this lady wasn't bright enough to understand the doctrine of salvation of the dead. She was bright enough, but what was the problem? What was the problem? She wasn't ready. Why wasn't she ready? Because we hadn't laid a proper foundation. You see what I'm saying? We're just sort of jumping into deep water all of a sudden. Now, if she had already understood certain key concepts, and if she had already had a discussion on the plan of salvation, and we had taught her the doctrine that the gospel of Jesus Christ is made available to every man, woman, and child, either in this life or in the life to come, and the ordinances of salvation, including baptism, will be made available either in this life or vicariously in temples. If we had laid a foundation for that, she might have said, Boy, that's beautiful. But as it was, because we presented things out of order, she, you know what she was thinking. She could picture a group of strange religionists out on the, the riverbank immersing corpses. And I wouldn't blame her. We always use, we never use meat when milk will do. There, there is what, the, what, what Elder Packer called, there's a system of gospel prerequisites. If you haven't had algebra, to jump to integral calculus is just a bit much. Okay? 
If you've never studied chemistry in any way, and you begin with the biochem class, it may be a big jump. We call that system prerequisites. And there's reason to prerequisites. We prep ourselves. And so it is with the gospel. The gospel needs to be presented. It isn't enough that the gospel will sell people well because it's so powerful. It is powerful. But it needs to be presented in a manner that's worthy of the message. The messengers, you and I, have to present it in a way that people can appreciate it. And if we present it in a jumbled up fashion, we shouldn't be surprised if people don't seem interested. Final principle. All of these are examples of what we call wisdom, using wisdom in response. Final principle is answer the questions from the right source. Answer from the right source. I remember when I was the institute director at Florida State University, the missionaries, uh, the elders and the sisters would come by regularly. I probably saw them twice a week. And they would often come, knock on my door, and want to talk with me, and ask me questions that went something like this. Brother Miller, can you give us a good scripture on such and such? I said, well, what do you need that for? Well, we're working with the Browns, and they are so great, but they want a scripture on. And what they always meant when they said that was, they wanted a Bible scripture on. And over the months, I tried to help them as best I can until it occurred to me how inappropriate it was what I was doing for the missionaries. And so one day, the knock came at the door, the two elders were there, and I said, come on in. And one of the elders said, Brother Millet, can you give us a good scripture on eternal marriage? I said, you mean a Bible scripture? Yeah, yeah, give us a Bible passage on eternal marriage. And I said, uh, no. What do you mean? I said, no. He says, no, you can't or no, you won't. I said, no, I won't and no, I can't. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, Elder, to my knowledge, that doctrine is not taught plainly in the Old or the New Testament. And the elder then just sort of went pale. All the color drained out of his face. And he said, well, what do you mean? Do, uh, it's not in the Bible? I said, no. He said, well, do, don't we believe in eternal marriage? I said, I think we do. <laughs> and he said, how can it not be in the Bible? I said, you see what he's asking? I said, elders, it ever occurred to you that if everything we teach or believe were in the Bible, we wouldn't have needed a Joseph Smith, a Book of Mormon, a Doctrine and Covenants, or a Restoration. And, it, he's, and then he said, oh, oh yeah, okay, all right, all right, all right. He says, well, these people, they want a scripture. I said, okay, you should sit down with them and read the 132nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses 15, 16, and 17. And he looked at me and he said, like, as if I had brain damage, he looked at me and said, uh, they're not going to go for this Doctrine and Covenants stuff. I said, Elder, that's modern revelation. If they're not prepared to receive modern revelation, they're certainly not golden, as you describe them. There's a principle here, and the principle is we must answer people's questions from the right source. If a person asks me, for example, why do you Latter-day Saints believe in baptism for the dead? The temptation is to say, oh, because it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. That's not why we believe in it. We believe in it because it came by revelation to Joseph Smith. It came to him as an independent revelation. I mean, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon or Oliver Cowdery weren't sitting around going through the Bible saying, oh, uh, uh, get down uh, baptism for the dead. We've got to come up with something on that. I mean, <laughs> no, revelations came, and then certain passages in the Bible made some sense. Okay? And so we answer from the right source. And this is an important message, brothers and sisters, because there is power in being loyal to the restoration. Your power will be greatly determined. Your spiritual power, your power to convince like Nephi and Lehi of old, the sons of Helaman, 
Your power will be directly related to the extent that you preach from modern revelation. Now that doesn't mean you hate the Bible or you don't use the Bible. We love the Bible. We cherish the Bible. But most of the doctrines that we have to deliver to the world that are distinctive to the Latter-day Saints came not from the Bible, but came rather through modern revelation. A friend of mine did some serious research in Africa. He interviewed 600 persons who had joined the church since the time of the revelation on priesthood. One of the questions he asked all 600 was this. When did you first know that the message the missionaries had to deliver was true? He said 90% of them said, when I heard the words Joseph Smith on my doorstep. See, we're here to declare glad tidings. You say, well, aren't we here to declare Christ? Yes, but in a different sort of way. Our message is to declare Christ as revealed through modern apostles and prophets. Our job is not to go out and reteach the Sermon on the Mount. Our job is not to go out and reteach the Bread of Life sermon. Our, our message, our, our charge is to deliver to the world a message that God has given to us. And we're specialists in that message. And that's what we declare. Now, a colleague of mine served as mission president, and he taught a great lesson, and this is, this is a good one to close on. And it ties with this, this that we've just been talking about. He taught his missionaries to understand this principle. We seek to answer any serious question by finding the most direct route to the sacred grove. We seek to answer any serious question by finding the most direct route to the sacred grove. Joseph Smith said it well, my brothers and sisters, when he said, the standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop this work from progressing. Persecutions may rage, enemies may combine, armies may assemble, calumny may defame, but the truth of God will go forth boldly, nobly, and independent till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear till the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall say the work is done. God bless you in what is perhaps the greatest season in the history of the world for taking the message of salvation to the world is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.